Okay. How are you? So, uh, so good afternoon. I just want to start first of all by thanking the folks at UMass Memorial, um, the entire Nixon, who's the CEO uh, and their organization, for their collaboration, creativity uh, with respect to setting up and standing up this um, step down facility for um, COVID 19 purposes as we approach uh, what everybody believes will be the surge um, of patients and the need for additional uh, hospital and, and step down capacity here in Massachusetts over the course of the next month or so. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the uh, Army, Na to the Army National Guard, to the General, uh, General Keefe, who's behind me here, and to Sam Phillips, who's the head of our MEMA operation for their work both on this site and um, their work in collaboration with the City of Boston and the hospitals there on the Boston site. And we continue to talk to and work with the Army Corps and with some of their contractors, um, Ashcrid here and EDS, and others about um, the possibility of uh, putting up other sites here in the Commonwealth to ensure that we have the capacity that we need uh, to serve people who still need to be attended to but probably don't need to be in a hospital so that we can maintain the hospital capacity uh, that we need to serve not just people who are dealing with COVID but also people who are dealing with other medical conditions over the course of the next five or six weeks. We also, the Lieutenant Governor and I both got an update today um, on Holyoke Soldiers Home. Uh, Val Liptak and the team there have gotten a ton of support from um, from the Guard and from others as they continue to do everything they possibly can to make sure that the people who are there are tested uh, and that the operation um, is safe. Um, at this point in time, I think all of the residents have been tested and they are now in the process of making sure that the entire staff gets tested. Uh, this process is being led by a mobile testing unit uh, that the Guard put up, which we plan to use around the Commonwealth to test uh, to test people uh, at nursing homes generally. Um, and I think you'll see this continue to happen over the course of, uh, of the next couple of months. Um, as I said yesterday, the, um, the Holyoke Soldiers Home is a place that the Lieutenant Governor and I and others have visited uh, multiple times over the course of the last few years. And, um, and it's always been a, um, a joy to be there. Um, it was for the family members who were usually there, talking to them about the way the place was looking after and taking care of their family members was always, uh, was always positive. The conversations and the discussions with many of the residents about their time in the military and, um, and their time at the home was, um, for me anyway, um, uplifting. I never spent less than an hour there. Um, and I, I considered it to be one of the best places we had in the, in, in the Commonwealth for uh, our military uh, families. Um, we hired Mark Perlstein this morning, who is a former first assistant prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Massachusetts. Uh, is currently a partner at McDermott, Will & Emery to conduct an independent investigation with respect to what happened uh, and when it happened. Uh, and what didn't happen and what didn't and when it didn't happen uh, in the period leading up to um, the discovery on Sunday night about what the state of play was there and uh, we are going to make sure Mark and his team have access to all the services and all the people that they need access to to get to the bottom of what took place. Um, and the final thing I just want to say is uh, I want to give a big shout out to Val. Um, she is, uh, she's an incredibly talented and credentialed medical professional. Um, she's done a terrific job as both the Chief Operating Officer and as the CEO at Western Mass Hospital. She stepped into this on several hours notice and based on the conversations we've had with her, um, is really sharp and exactly the right kind of person with the support of the Guard and others uh, from our administration and from elsewhere. Um, to, to, rewrite the, uh, to rewrite the operation there. And with that, I do want to give the Lieutenant Governor, we're in her backyard, she knows all the players here, a chance to say a few words about, about this setup and um, the work that's being done in conjunction with UMass 
uh, to prepare for uh, to prepare for the surge. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, and, and good afternoon, and welcome to my hometown area. I have to say that I'm quite proud that Worcester, Massachusetts, is standing up the first medical field hospital here in our Commonwealth. Uh, let me just start by saying it's hard to believe that a few weeks ago uh, the governor declared a state of emergency. And it seems, I'm sure for all of you, that a few weeks ago our lives were very different and seemed so far away from where we are today. Uh, like you, I wake up and feel mixed emotions. You know, as a mother, uh, seeing my kids access their online learning or at least try to do the best they can there. Uh, as a, a mother with my husband, not to see them play their sports and be on the sidelines with friends and enjoying those kinds of activities. Uh, life has changed so much uh, for all of us, and it's right to feel those mixed emotions when you wake up. But I will tell you, and I'm sure the governor feels the same way, there's one emotion that I feel every single day, and that is the one of feeling inspired by what we see literally in the view of our screens on TV or in social media, or by what the governor and I see in our work every day. And that's the amazing ability for our first responders and emergency responders to leave their families, to put on gear that they wouldn't normally put on, and to get out there and serve and protect the people of their community and of this commonwealth. In particular, to see the frontline medical community do amazing work without question, going into rooms with sick patients, uh, literally coming into contact with a part of humanity that is diagnosed with this illness and helping them recover is just really, to all of us, uh, really amazing to see, but I think we all feel very grateful that we have these brave men and women among us doing that work for us every single day. And uh, unfortunately, they'll be at it for, for a lot longer and certainly deserve our prayers and support. I want to just express uh, how uh, grateful I am uh, to UMass Medical, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Eric Dixon. Uh, I had a conversation with him at the beginning of this effort, and he said, LG, don't worry, I got this. This is what I'm made for. I know how to do this. You know, I'm a, an emergency medicine uh, professional, and I've been here, and I'm ready to, to take this on. And I was able to listen in to the UMass command uh, meeting that they have every morning. And although I physically wasn't there, I felt an incredible sense of collaboration, professionalism, support to each member of that team to make decisions in the best interest and health of the people that UMass would need to serve. And for them to literally you know, raise their hand and say, we can set up this bed capacity, which we know we will need because we do not have enough capacity in our ICUs to uh, handle the patients uh, that need the care there and the ones that are stepping out of that care into a less acute need uh, without setting up a field hospital like this. And to see them literally uh, greet uh, the, the trucks coming in and to unpack this equipment and it literally uh, gr medical students graduating online yesterday that will be coming into this facility to care for the individuals in our community is really outstanding and I couldn't be more proud of the UMass team. I would like to give a, sort of a call to action on behalf of Dr. Dixon. Uh, while this is a physical setup, it doesn't work without the professional people here to staff it. And at full capacity with 250 beds full, they will need uh, docs and residents and registered nurses and uh, personal care associates to help take care of this population of people. So he's recruiting volunteers to step up and devote their time to help with this effort. You can go online to their website, fill out the application, and be part of the team uh, to help uh, fight back the COVID-19 epidemic here in our Commonwealth. The other uh, group that I'd like to acknowledge is the city of Worcester, 
because UMass has partnered with the city of Worcester to stand up this facility uh, to operate it and staff it. And I can't help but think uh, that the city of Worcester is ready for this moment, but they're made for this moment. And it's perhaps because the city has had experience managing through uh, crises in the past. I think many of you uh, think of Worcester and you think of our fire service and how impacted it has, has been over these past uh, decades. And so they are clearly uh, able uh, to rise to this occasion and to work in partnership with the federal government, with UMass, to set up this facility and to, to serve. So today, I hope that in the midst of the chaos and the, the sadness and the disruption that COVID-19 brings to all of us, that you too feel inspired by the amazing men and women who literally are gowning up and gearing up with more protective equipment on the way to help them do their jobs to make people uh, healthier and safer, uh, not only through this crisis, but to be prepared after it uh, to be ready to get back into the routines and lifestyles that we so appreciate. Uh, so thank you. Uh, for those of you interested, join the effort if you have the medical training and background and be available to volunteer and serve. Thank you. Thanks, LJ. Questions? Well, first of all, part of the point behind having an independent third party come in to investigate the, um, the current stat state of play there is to make sure that we get answers to many of the questions that people have. Um, and that's exactly why we hired Mark Perlstein to come in and do that. I don't anticipate anything other than this point, other than a thorough investigation by a trained professional who has an outstanding reputation, who I believe will give us what we want which is answers to what happened there and what went wrong and why. And what we can do to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Soldiers Home is a, uh, is a terrific institution and Cheryl Poppy is a spectacular leader and she has a great team. And, um, and they followed all the rules and protocols that they're supposed to follow with respect to both operating um, an elder care facility in a time of COVID-19 and reporting on critical incidents when they occur. Um, my understanding is there was one death uh, reported day before yesterday, I think, and a second death reported either last night or this morning. So there are two. Pardon me? Yep. Everybody who was um, who was transferred was tested, um, which is the appropriate protocol. And uh, and the person who was uh, who was tested positive was not transferred because they tested positive. And the reason we knew they were positive was because everybody who was going to be transferred was tested. And the point behind that exercise, and this is important, um, in other states that have seen big time enhancements in uh, the number of people they have to serve and the population that they need to treat as they head into a surge, um, have ended up putting a lot of people who didn't need hospital level care but were COVID positive uh, into facilities, step down facilities like skilled nursing facilities in the same facility with people who aren't COVID-19 positive. Um, we don't happen to think that's the right way to handle this. We think the way to handle this is to do everything we possibly can to keep our elders, especially those um, in uh, nursing home institutions and institutions that are designed to treat non-COVID people and to do all the things that our guidance and the other guidance that's put out by the feds and everybody else um, is designed to keep people from contracting COVID in the first place and then set up skilled nursing level of care that is staffed and organized and geared specifically to treat people 
who are COVID positive but ought not to be in an acute care facility, similar to this one here. I don't know exactly what's going on resident by resident, but I can tell you that um, Val understands all the protocols associated with how to deal with this, and she's implementing them with the help of uh, some of the staff who are there and a bunch of medical folks from the guard. Well, keep in mind that um, there are two. There are two for sure. One here and one at the BCEC in Boston. Um, we're also looking at other sites around the Commonwealth and are basically in daily conversations through the command center with our colleagues in the, um, in the hospital community to determine where else we may need capacity, not just field ho hospital capacity, but also additional um, skilled nursing capacity as well. And, um, and we literally are thinking about this regionally. You know, what are we doing? This is sort of like what I would describe as central mass, right? But there are going to be ultimately strategies for the Cape, for the South Coast, uh, for Western Mass, for um, uh, Merrimack Valley, and for Boston. And each strategy is going to be based on the existing capacity that exists in each of those places and, uh, and what people's anticipated requirements um, in a surge are going, to, are going to demand. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we put in place the capacity that people believe they need so that not only, as the Lieutenant Governor said, we can serve the people who are dealing with and battling their way through COVID, but that we also can continue to serve people we have traditionally served in our healthcare system who don't have a COVID issue, uh, but may have a, an acute medical need or a, or a nursing need uh, that need to be served as well. Well, the first thing is I, I'm pretty sure that the appointments made by the board um, always has been. They always wanted to create a certain distance between the facility and the administration. Um, but part of the review is going to determine what actually happened and who didn't do what uh, and who did um, over the course of the, the period to be studied. And obviously, um, the superintendent's performance during that period is going to be part of that review. I don't think we're looking at the possibility of another Holyoke and Chelsea. No, I don't. Um, but I will tell you that one of the reasons why we put so many protocols in place over the past three or four months with respect to assisted living facilities, congregate care facilities, nursing homes and elder care facilities is because there's no population that's more at risk um, when it comes to this particular contagion than seniors, and especially those who live in um, quarters that are designed to serve them. And, um, and in every part of the country, people are working uh, to come up with strategies and approaches to do everything we possibly can to protect this population. Um, and that's true here in the Commonwealth as well. I can't answer that question at this point in time, but part of the reason we created the mobile testing unit was so that we could work our way around the elder care community and test people accordingly. I think we're going to have a lot more to say about gear tomorrow. And I'm going to leave it at that. Pardon me? I'm going to talk about it. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. I mean, look, I've expressed significant concerns about a lot of things associated with gear over the course of the past uh, two or three weeks, and um, and I've also said that we've been working a variety of processes and opportunities to make sure that we have the gear that we need to serve our um, our medical community and our first responders and our emergency medical community. And I've also said that I expected to have 
more information on this later this week, and I do. <laughs> Um, we're still putting that together with, uh, with each region. Remember, we're not thinking about this as a statewide number. We're thinking about it based on each region of the Commonwealth. And, and that number depends a lot on how many other kinds of beds you have. Because remember, this is a question about throughput, right? If you have a certain amount of capacity like this or like Beaumont or like the uh, field hospital that's going to get put up at the BCEC or some of the other step-down facilities that we're developing, then the number of ICU beds you need changes, okay? Because the whole point here is that most people will need to be at one level of care for a certain period of time and then another level of care. So from our point of view, the real question is, how many of each level do you need? And based on how many of each you have, how many of the other levels do you need to actually meet the demand um, for services during that period of time. And those numbers, they change based on how many, how many units you think you have, how many beds you have, how much staff you have uh, at each level of care. Pardon me? Uh, I guess what I would say is we're going to expect that Mark will be, um, will be diligent and we'll make sure that whatever he needs is available to him. But uh, I don't want him to rush this. I want him, I want him to get it right. And I think I speak for every single family and every single uh, person who worked there and everybody who, um, who cares about that place that at the end of the day, what we really want is the right answer. Pardon me? You know, the hard part about calculating recovery is uh, people aren't required to tell us, okay? And um, one, of the, one of the reasons why we've been so aggressive about expanding our testing um, is because we want to know two things. Number one, how many people are we testing who are positive so that we can actually act on that and do the follow-up work with respect to making sure that those who've had close contact with them know that they've tested positive. Um, and the second is to actually start to develop what I would call um, kind of a, an appreciation and understanding of where a lot of the positives are landing so that we can make decisions around things like how we're going to organize um, our healthcare capacity to deal with the surge based on some of that data as it comes in. You should know that we're now, um, we're either number three or number four. Uh, with respect to the most number of tests issued by any state. The only two states that I think are ahead of us at this point are New York and, and Washington. Um, but I think in many ways the testing piece is a key part of how you ultimately uh, get an understanding and appreciation about where your resources need to be deployed and, um, and what you need to do uh, to deal with this. Remember, you know, somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the people who are um, deemed um, infected by COVID based on the CDC's analysis of this are asymptomatic. So the fact that a lot of people who, who get tested come back negative, that's a good thing to know. But in addition, the thing everybody should understand here is there are a lot of, <laughs> the whole point behind social distancing, right? The whole point behind all this work that we're doing, all the disruption we're creating for people, all the major changes in the way we live, is about keeping people far enough away from each other for a long enough period of time that people don't pass this from one person to the next. And I can't express how important that is, not just for people who are symptomatic, but also for people who are asymptomatic. If really 20% or 25% of the folks who are infected with this are never going to show symptoms for this. It's really important that we all respect that and do everything we can to stay away from each other. The big conversations we're having right now with our colleagues in, um, in education are about 
what are we going to do to make sure kids actually learn something between now and the end of the year? Um, the, I'm sure that my kids are in their 20s, so this is less of an issue for me than it is for the Lieutenant Governor personally. Um, I think it would be a shame if for the next three or four months, whether the kids go back to school sometime in May or not, um, they don't spend any time developing any more knowledge um, than they had when, when they got sent home. And I get the fact that it's complicated, but there are a lot of schools and a lot of teachers who are doing some really interesting things to keep in touch with and to provide educational opportunities for their kids. And, uh, and we're doing everything we can when we come across these to share them with others and to encourage people um, to be as creative as they can be to provide kids with the educational experience um, that they need. The, um, the issue with respect to, um, to, with respect to May 4th is a decision we're going to have to make at some point, and I get that. But I think what people really ought to be focused on is a little less on how do we turn summer vacation into starting tomorrow and more into what are we going to do to make sure that whatever happens between now and the end of June, we're doing everything we possibly can as a commonwealth um, and as communities and as school districts and as schools to make sure that kids uh, don't end up having to view this as a completely lost opportunity to continue to grow and to continue to learn. That's my biggest concern at this point. Yeah. I can't answer that question. I can tell you that uh, the conversations are, we're pretty deep into them at this point with the city and with some of the Boston hospitals. And, um, and I would expect that it would be sometime in the same time frame that we've been talking about here. Um, pardon me? Um, I think part of the reason for trying to do it this way is um, if you create a unified site like that, you can actually, one of the nice things about this, uh, and when you look out here, it looks a little barren and open at this point, but the bottom line is you have a lot of latitude to create a model that's been used in a lot of other places and been used successfully and to understand exactly what you need to actually stand up. I mean, the first time the Army Corps came to meet with us, they literally showed up with um, almost like a cookbook. And, yeah, you call it a menu, I call it a cookbook. But like, these are the things we do, you know, and this is what works in this circumstance, this is what we do in this circumstance, this is what we do in this circumstance. And when you have an open floor plan like this, um, you have the flexibility to literally take one of these designs, it's basically um, built to be built quickly to solve a particular set of problems and it has been proven on a number of occasions to be successful and do it. And that's a much easier answer than trying to find a way to work within the confines of the frameworks of either dormitories or hotels. I will say this, we expect and anticipate that um, in parts of Massachusetts, dormitories and hotels are going to be used um, for a variety of purposes that have to do with supporting healthcare workers and in some cases probably used um, for isolation and, and quarantine opportunities. But I, but I really do think this model, because it's proven and because everybody knows, generally speaking, what it is you need to do to stand one up, and it's been done a lot of times successfully, is probably a better way to create a step down than to try and force one into an existing structure um, that isn't really built for it in the first place. Say again. They were open last week? Yes. Uh, where is that that surprises me. They shouldn't have been open last week. Um, the, only, the only folks on the, uh, on the firearm side that have been essential um, in Massachusetts since we in issued the initial order are manufacturers. No. No. The order? The order? What, what did? The only thing that changed was the way it was um, codified in the federal um, 
essential, uh, essential business and essential worker list. But in Massachusetts, manufacturers were considered to be essential in round one, and they were considered to be essential in round two. Gun shops were not. Non-essential, can you define non-essential? We did define non-essential construction. We also defined essential construction based on the federal guidelines and criteria. Um, the federal guidelines basically said healthcare facilities, essential construction, okay? They also said transportation, essential construction. They said emergency work on utilities and, um, and, uh, and telecom essential construction for a lot of reasons. I mean, everybody is trying to upgrade their telecom capacity right now because they have about 50 times as much traffic running through it as they had running through it three weeks ago. Um, they also said housing is essential construction because they acknowledged that this country and this commonwealth, by the way, has a terrible housing shortage and not to continue to complete housing projects would be a big mistake. Um, what they said was non-essential was office buildings, retail, and hotels. And so we basically adopted the federal standards around what was considered to be essential and what was considered to be non-essential. The other thing we did was we put out pretty stringent guidelines around what you needed to do to do this safely. And we basically said to cities and towns, um, these are our guidelines, they're what we're gonna use on our projects, okay? which are considered to be essential because most of them fall into the infrastructure category that we just talked about. And we expect that you can either adopt these and enforce them, or uh, if you need help enforcing them, ask us and we'll bring people uh, who are trained inspectors uh, to help you do that. Or if you want to do something else, you can do something else too. And if you don't deem projects in your community to be ones that you believe you can actually enforce, um, and oversee successfully around the guidelines that we've put together with respect to what a safe site should look like, um, then you have the ability uh, to prohibit that project from going forward. But there are certain kinds of projects in construction that were deemed by the feds to be essential, and we adopted those recommendations. Thanks, everybody.